want me to No empty words to no white lies No token prayer, no compromise I want to shine the light you gave Through your son you said to save us From ourselves and our despair It comforts me to know you're really Good morning. Good morning. We are so glad you're here and uh, we are ready to worship. I hope you're ready to worship too. So if you would, please stand and join us as we begin.
gather together today to celebrate that now is the time to worship. Psalm 118 reminds us, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. The psalmist continues, shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will proclaim what the Lord has done. Then he finishes with the words, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For the house of the Lord, or from the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. Today, as we continue to worship and sing here in the Lord's house, we want his name to be, receive all the glory. So let's continue as we praise his name together.
Please stand and join us on our next song.
You may be seated. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I hope you are glad to be here today. Uh, there are some churches where people come out because they feel they have to be there and let's just get it over with so we can go on with our week. But as Christians who love the Lord and desire to praise Him, it should be a highlight of our week when we get to gather together and praise the Lord together and learn more about Him through His Word and rejoice and encourage one another and bless one another. So it is good to have you here. We have not been doing greetings, but just turn around and wave to everybody. Good to see you all here this morning. We, uh, we often uh, come to church and we fail to... Uh, to greet everybody. We can't see everybody and talk to everybody li like we'd like to, but it's always good to not always just talk to the same person week after week, but to get to know one another because we have some wonderful people here in this congregation and uh, seated around you. You might say, well, I don't know so-and-so. Patsy Crandall, I don't know Patsy that well, but we, you might find that the person you don't know is the person who could be your best friend. So always take time to greet one another and share with one another. Uh, we share our joys and we share our sorrows. Um, thinking out loud here. Oh, I can't come up with that phrase. Something about a joys are doubled and sorrows are halved. But when we, anybody know that quote? But as we share our joys, that's a joy for the other person. And as we share our burdens, we join together in praying for needs. So let me share some needs with you this morning. Number one, and as you look around, not only do you see who is here, and you see who's not here. So if you see somebody who's not here, give them a card, drop them, send a card to them, give them a phone call, say, hey, we missed you, hope you're doing okay. Uh, but uh, Mike and Jana McCready are not here today because they are traveling uh, today and now spending some time together. So uh, we hope they have a wonderful time. That's one of the joys. But one of the sorrows, you see, Rick and Sharon Wood are not here today. Sharon was uh, doing a little painting of some trim in their bedroom yesterday, and she fell off a stepladder, broke her arm in a couple places, destroyed her shoulder. She will have to have shoulder replacement surgery. She's up at St. Mary's Hospital, uh, but with all the COVID restrictions, Rick is the only person who can get in to see her. Uh, but she also is on a blood thinner, so they have to wait a couple days for, that, uh, for her blood to thicken up before they can do any type of surgery. So keep Rick and Sharon Wood in your prayers today. Secondly, uh, Jim, what you shared in Sunday school, is that fair game to share with the whole congregation? Okay. Uh, Jim's son-in-law, Doug Keller, found out that he has kidney cancer, and he only has one kidney. So they are looking at going in, doing some surgery on that, but please keep Doug and Tammy in your prayers. Many of you know Dr. Keller, uh, the chiropractor here in town. Many of you know Tammy. We've prayed for her for so long, uh, going through her, her double transplant, and she is doing wonderful now, but Doug now uh, needs our prayers especially. Then uh, in the bulletin, you'll see Josiah Balsley serving in the Army is going over to Syria. He leaves next weekend. And he'll be over there until somewhere around next June. Uh, so uh, that will be a big step for him. And uh, whenever I pray for him, along with praying for his safety, I pray that God will use all of his experiences really just to develop him into a, a great leader. He has great leadership potential. So pray for Josiah as he goes over to Syria. And pray especially for his safety. He's going to be doing uh, gate guard duty. And uh, so at the military base they can't shoot first anybody comes up they can't shoot unless the other person shoots first and so it's a very dangerous position to be in think how would you be praying if it was your son who was going over there pray the same way for josiah then uh, it is good to have amy with us today and singing for us and having a good day but amy is looking at some upcoming surgery possibly uh, with some stenosis that she has that contributes to the chronic headaches. And so uh, pray for Amy as she 
waits to get a hold of the doctors to schedule a time to go in and meet. And so continue to keep Amy in your prayers as well. So a number of prayer requests today. It's always uh, good to pray for one another and lift each other up in prayer. Uh, in fact, let's go to the prayer right now. Father, what a joy it is to know that we don't have to come to church to pray. We don't have to go through a ritual, but we can just uh, pour out our hearts to you, use whatever words come to our mind. Sometimes we don't even use words, and uh, the Spirit just uh, speaks out. But Lord, today we share our hearts with these who are struggling right now. And we've mentioned these various situations, and in each case we do pray that you would provide your help, your healing, your safety, your protection, your peace and comfort. We pray for family members that you would free them from any anxiety or fear and give them a perfect peace. And Lord, we look forward to giving you praise in each of these situations. We are thankful that we have a God who does hear and answer prayer today. And so Lord, it is, is a delight to worship you together as a body today. And Lord, one of the things we worship you for is your great salvation you have done for us what we could never do on our own you have dealt with the issue of our sin by sending your son jesus to die for us and thank you lord today for your great salvation that you offer so freely and so we celebrate your great salvation and especially as we uh, enter into a time of taking communion together May we be reminded how great your love is and how wonderful your salvation is for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here at Bethel, we have an open communion. On the first Sundays of the month, we take the bread and the juice together to remember the body and blood of Christ. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11 about it and says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'll ask those who are helping to come forward at this time. We remember the Lord's death. We remember not only that Jesus died on the cross, and rose again not only that uh, he died for to provide salvation but we understand he died for me and for you each one of us is the reason why jesus died on the cross and so as we take the bread and the juice together today we understand jesus did this all just for us because of his love for us as the plates are passed feel free to take one of the cups and then if you haven't used these little cups before, we'll explain once everyone has had uh, the chance to have one and we'll all partake together. But before they're distributed, let's have a prayer. Lord, today we are thankful for the chance to share the Lord's Supper, to take the bread and the juice and remember the body and blood of Jesus given for us. And we pray as we do that, that it would not just be a ritual that we do, but it would be a time for us to remember what you have done for us and make it help us to appreciate our salvation so much greater so bless this time we ask in jesus name amen <laughs>
you haven't used these little cups before, if you take the little purple clear tab at the top and pull that back, that will expose the little wafer for you. So we pull the little clear purple one first, and that gives us access to the little white wafer. We take that little wafer and we remember the body of Jesus given for us. It was beaten, it was spit upon, thorns placed in his brow, the blood running down his body. We think of all Jesus endured. He endured that all because of his love for us. So take and eat and remember the body of Christ. Father, we do remember today and we give you thanks for your son Jesus and his great sacrifice for us. Amen. If you then take the foil wrap and pull that back and that will expose the juice. We understand that uh, in the Old Testament so much talk about animal sacrifice. But Hebrews tells us that the blood of all the bulls and goats never took away sin. It merely looked forward to the day when Jesus would come as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And as Jesus shed his blood for us, we find forgiveness. And so we take the juice today and remember the blood of Jesus Christ, which gives us forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Father, as we have taken the bread and taken the juice today, we remember anew and afresh your great love, your great salvation, and we say we are grateful. We are grateful for all you've done. We are grateful for the way you change us and continue to work to make us more and more like Jesus every day. So thank you for this chance to remember today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Children are dismissed for Children's Church at this time. If you are staying with us here, I'd invite you to turn to the book of 1 Timothy. The book of 1 Timothy. We have spent the last couple months in the Old Testament looking at the life of Samuel. And uh, now we're going to switch to the New Testament and look at this letter of 1 Timothy. The book of 1 Timothy is one of the pastoral letters of Paul, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. 1 Timothy is written to this young pastor, Timothy, who is in the city of Ephesus. And really, it is a book that is a book for each one of us to know how to live and conduct ourselves in a culture that is increasingly turning away from God. This is what Ephesus was like. It is the capital city of what then was called Asia Minor. Today is the country of Turkey. It is a large seaport town, and it was the center of the worship of the goddess Artemis, also called Diana. If you remember back in Acts chapter 19, there was a riot in town because one of the key sources of income for the town was making these little little figurines of the goddess Diana and selling them to everybody. There was rampant prostitution and sex trafficking in Ephesus. But Paul came there and he started a church. And then in Acts chapter 20, Paul leaves them and he warns that false teachers are going to come to the church, be on guard. The book of Acts ends with Paul going off to Rome. And he is there under house arrest for a couple years. But after the book of Acts, Paul is released. He travels around some more, and he goes back and encourages the churches. So as he comes back to Ephesus, he brings with him Timothy, his uh, young mentee, and he leaves Timothy there in Ephesus. Paul continues on. He ends up being imprisoned in Rome a second time in the Mamertine prison, and he ends up then dying there in Rome. Tradition tells us he is beheaded in Rome. So Timothy, this young man, is left at Ephesus. Because he's a young man, sometimes people don't respect him the way that they should. Timothy, Timothy is timid and he's shy. You might say he's a mama's boy. Uh, we read about his mother and grandmother, but no father in the picture. He is sometimes sickly or at least so troubled by problems that he has stomach problems. And the tension in the church at Ephesus has him to the point of wanting to give up. It's easy to happen, especially for young pastors. Because people can say such encouraging things. A pastor can prepare so diligently for the sermon, and on the way out, people will say things like, Well, pastor, you always manage to find something to say and fill up the time, don't you? Or they'll say, I don't care what everyone else says. I think your sermon's pretty good. 
or to say, Pastor, if I'd known you were going to be this good today, I would have invited somebody along with me. So Timothy had had it at Ephesus. He was ready to quit. And Paul gives him this letter to encourage Timothy and to remind Timothy and us how the church of God should be managed. In uh, looking at an overview of the book, we might use this outline. Chapter 1, we must preach truthfully. Chapter 2, we must pray fervently. Chapter 3, we must live diligently. Chapter 4, we must persevere constantly. Chapter 5, we must relate properly and personally. And chapter 6, we must pursue righteous endlessly. Or put another way, we need a right focus on the church's doctrine, worship, leadership, moral behavior, social responsibilities, and attitudes toward possessions. So that's what we're going to look at in the chapters ahead. But today we are on chapter 1, so let's look at the first few verses of 1 Timothy 1 together. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to your word today, we pray that you would turn the light on for us. Give us insight into the lessons that Paul gives to Timothy and help us, Lord, to be able to take your truth and apply it to the situation we live in here today. So teach us from your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When we write letters, we always sign our names at the bottom of the letter. In the New Testament, they wrote their letters and signed their names at the front end. So uh, we can see right up front here in verse 1, this is a letter from Paul the Apostle. We could talk for a long time about Paul and how God worked in his life, but uh, we're not going to today because this is about Timothy, not about Paul. But uh, if you don't know the story of Paul, by all means, uh, study it, learn it, uh, go through the book of Acts and find Paul's story. But Paul writes to Timothy, and Paul reminds Timothy that God is a God of hope. And that's what Timothy needed, hope. And that's what each one of us needs. When Satan tries to get us to be discouraged and defeated, we need to hold on to hope. Hebrews 10 tells us that hope is an anchor for the soul. When you have hope in God working in your situation, nothing will sway you. So Paul writes and uh, gives Timothy hope. It's easy to lose hope in our daily lives. We try to do our best, but we don't get ahead in our jobs. Sometimes we even lose ground. You try to be a faithful witness to your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers, but we don't seem to see any change. We come to church and we see church the same as it has been. We struggle with committed workers, making budget, paying the bills, and we say, wouldn't it be easier just to give up and forget about church but we remember God is a God of hope. And that hope gives us a confident reassurance that God is at work in our lives in his church. And so we continue on faithfully serving God day in and day out. And that's what Paul encourages Timothy to do as well. Not to give up, hold on to hope, continue to faithfully serve God day in and day out. Stay the course. Stay in Ephesus and keep doing the job that God had given him there. So let's continue on verse 3. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. 
These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. So Timothy has a job to do. Paul left him at Ephesus on purpose with a job to accomplish. Something was to be done. What is it? It's to speak up for the truth. Or worded another way, teach sound doctrine. But I like the phrasing, speak up for the truth, because sometimes it's easy for us to say, well, I'm not a teacher, and the idea of doctrine, that sounds like, what, what in the world is doctrine? Speak up for the truth is something we can all relate to, because we are confronted daily with opportunities to speak up for that which is true. We live in a relative society where nobody wants to admit there is right and wrong, where there is truth and error. Everybody wants to talk about tolerance and accepting other people's viewpoints. And, well, that might be true for you, but it's not true for me. But the truth is the truth, no matter how anybody feels about it. And there can't be two opposite truths. You might believe that abortion is a woman's choice and a fetus is just a lump of tissue, and I might believe that that fetus is a child in the mother's womb and that abortion is murder. We can't both be right. So many times, people want to say, well, that's your truth. But truth is truth all the time. I don't know if you saw the exchange this past week with Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene from Georgia and Representative Debbie Dingell from Michigan, but conflict over the question of abortion. Two differing views. They both can't be right. You might believe that the Bible teaches that we can express ourselves sexually with anyone we choose. I might believe that sexual expression is bound by certain biblical guidelines. We can't both be right. Truth is not relative. Either 2 plus 2 equals 4 or it doesn't. But truth is absolute. So where do we find the truth? Pilate asked that same question to Jesus. What is truth? And Jesus, thankfully, gives us the answer, John 17, 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So in a culture that sways back and forth with every wave of thought, we find truth in the word of God. If God says it, believe it. Because it is true regardless of what anyone in the culture says has to say. We never need to accept Satan's lies as truth. Even when it is politically incorrect, we need to speak up for the truth, speak up for what is right. Even when everyone goes against you at work or in your neighborhood or at your family gatherings, never be afraid to stand up for truth. That's what Paul commands Timothy. There is a truth that needs to be maintained. So Timothy's job is to make sure that the church does not drift away into false teaching. Paul says in verse 3 that Timothy is to command certain men to not teach false doctrines any longer. This term command is the idea of passing on orders from a superior officer. It is a military term. The general gives orders to the corporal who passes them down to the sergeant who then passes on the orders to the privates. The commands are passed on down the line. Paul receives truth from Christ and Paul passes it on to Timothy who is supposed to pass that truth on to the church at Ephesus. Over in 2 Timothy 2, uh, Paul gives that similar idea again. He says, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So when we come out to church and we hear the word of God taught, 
Understand I'm not seeking to share my ideas with you. My role is just to pass on what God has already t- declared in his word. The truth is God's truth. And I simply try to help you understand what God has already said. Timothy's charge was to get false teachers to get back to the gospel, back to the truth. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, Preach the word, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Reality is that there are many people who don't like truth as much as they want to hear something that's new, that's exciting, that's interesting. Well, I never heard that before. Isn't that great? We need to make sure that our desire is not just for something that sounds good, that sounds acceptable, that sounds pleasing to hear, but that we always focus on what is truth. Paul told Timothy he had the job to do. Teach sound doctrine and stop false teaching. We often don't like doctrine because we think it's boring. Few people want to study the attributes of God or the consequences of sin. And we like to focus on things about how to be a better father, how to love your spouse better, how to succeed financially. But to do all those things, we need a foundation of truth. When you build a house, you don't start by putting in a bay window and getting the siding ready. You start by pouring a foundation. And then on that foundation, you put your beams, your studs. The last thing to be added is the external decoration. We have far too many Christians who want lives focused just on the decoration, who don't want to look at truth. So, Timothy is to speak up for the truth. And Paul mentions two ways to do that. To stop false teaching and stop, I'll use the words, sensational teaching. What's the difference? Paul says, command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. First of all is false teaching. False teaching is heresy. It is that which is opposed to the truth. It takes the truth and it twists it. It turns it. It perverts it. It changes it. And back in Acts 20, Paul had predicted to the Ephesian elders, this is going to happen. You're going to have false teachers come in. And that actually came true, because Paul now here tells Timothy, command them not to teach any longer. So there was false teaching taking place. And Paul and Timothy is to stop it, to stop letting false teaching continue. There are all types of false doctrines that we face in the church. Like what? Well, right up the road, we've got this beautiful brick church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? We we follow Jesus in these latter days. Uh, Are they a great church? No, they're not. Because there is false teaching there. That church, also known as the Mormon Church, if you look at what they believe, when Mormons come to your door, You probably all had them come to your door and they say, wouldn't you love to have your family all get along? Wouldn't you love to have the day when we can just all have peace in our society? Well, that'd be wonderful. But what they don't tell you is the foundational truth. The the Mormon church teaches that you can become a god. Populate your own universe with your spirit wives and your spirit children. Say, well, that's not in the Bible. No, it's not. It's heresy. It goes against what the Bible teaches. They also teach, well, you know, Jesus and Satan, they were brothers. Where do you come up with that? It's not from the Word of God. It's heresy. You say, well, I know somebody who goes to that church. They don't believe that. Maybe they don't. But that's what the church teaches. It's heresy. 
Right down the street's another church, United Pentecostal Church. Say, well, doesn't that look like a great place for Christians to go and worship? But understand that the United Pentecostal denomination doesn't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe that God exists in three persons as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They say, well, you know, when, Jesus, when God does one thing, we call him Father. When he does another thing, we call him the Son. When he does another, they're just names, different names, but only one God. You say, but when Jesus is baptized, the Father is speaking from heaven and the Holy Spirit is there like a dove. Say, just different names? Heresy. False teaching. Go a little bit further down the street, down by Emerson, you got this little building that's there, the uh, Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, it does, doesn't that sound great? We should all be a witness for Jehovah. But they call themselves that because they believe that Jesus is not God. Oh, they, oh yeah, Jesus is God. He's just a lesser God. Only Jehovah is God. Jesus, he's a lesser God. But somehow that overlooks Jesus' statement in the Scriptures where he says, I and the Father are one. There is false teaching all around us. And we need to be on guard because sometimes false teaching sounds so good. And it's so easy to listen to somebody who's such a smooth talker and what they say sounds good and they slip in a little bit of false teaching. And we need to be on guard. But then there is another diversion from the truth that Timothy is told to watch out for. Heresy, yes, but heresy, that which is contrary to Scripture. But then what I call sensational teaching, that which goes beyond Scripture. It's things that Scripture never talks about. For the Jews, uh, there were many J stories in Jewish tradition about things that happened outside of what the Bible records and stories about certain angels and their exploits and well did you know that there's this angel so and so and he did this and that and the other and it's not ever, not found so you can't say it's heresy because the bible doesn't even talk about it but it's all these made up stories that they have they made up genealogies of heroes and taught special tales that were not biblical so how does that play out today we have all types of sensational stories that come to us uh, if you've ever been on the internet and browsed around, did you ever see this, the pictures of the massive giant skeletons that people have found? You see, wow, look at that little guy in the light blue, and if he's six foot tall, how big must that giant have been? Say, don't you believe in giants, Pastor? Yes, I do. But the problem is these pictures that you find are hoaxes. They are photoshopped pictures. So much of this speculative teaching does exactly what Paul says in verse 4. They promote controversies rather than God's work. I remember back when I was in, in high school and college, some friends from my church back home used to love to argue back and forth. Who are the sons of God in Genesis 6? Are they angels or are they demons? or, or who, who are these sons of God? you're not familiar with that passage look it up and you'll probably have some questions but the reality is that we end up often dreaming up crazy biblical interpretations because things sound sensational and we like something that sounds sensational don't let yourself fall prey into believing something because it sounds exciting I remember once I got an email about an archaeologist who claimed to find the chariots of Pharaoh in the Red Sea. Could that be true? Well, it sure sounds exciting. And do I believe that the chariots ended up being there, that the biblical, the biblical account happened as it says? I do. But the problem with this one archaeologist, number one, he has a history of false discoveries. Number two, he never brought any proof to any reputable archaeologists and number three he showed a picture of the chariot wheels on the chariot when exodus says that god knocked the wheels off the chariots so don't let your focus be on sensational teaching there's a lot of false teachers oh they've got something that sounds exciting it sounds sensational 
Don't let that be your focus. Instead, focus on the truth of the Word of God. So Timothy is to speak up for the truth. When it comes to false teaching, let me offer a couple principles for you to think about. Number one, base doctrine on the literal statements of the Bible, not figurative portions. Don't go to the book of Song, Song of Solomon to make up your theology, your ideas about God. Number two, base doctrine on the plain statements of the Bible, not obscure ones. Base doctrine on the teaching passages, not historical or poetry passages. Base doctrine on all relevant passages. Don't just pull out one phrase or one verse and say, well, here's my idea because this phrase says such and so. Don't base doctrine on speculations or guesses. So many people look at a, a phrase and say, I think it means this. Emphasize what Scripture emphasizes. And speaking of emphasizing what the Scripture emphasizes, look down in verse 7. Paul alludes to the fact that they were using the law wrongly. He says, they want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. So there were those at Ephesus who were taking the Old Testament law, uh, the, the books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the hundreds of rules and regulations in there, and they were twisting it to serve their purposes. The Pharisees, the religious leaders in Jesus' day, were experts at that. They would try to find their righteousness because they kept all the law meticulously. But the Ten Commandments never saved anyone. In fact, the only thing that the Ten Commandments and all the rest of all those hundreds of laws and regulations did is to damn people. The Old Testament law does not save us, rather it condemns us. It shows us that none of us is perfect, that we are all sinners. Paul makes that clear in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. For no one can ever be made right in God's sight by doing what his law commands. For the more we know God's law, the clearer it becomes that we aren't obeying it. So the law shows us that we don't do right. But now God has shown us a different way of being right in his sight, not by obeying the law, but by the way promised in the scriptures long ago. We are made right in God's sight when we trust in Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we can all be saved in this same way, no matter who we are or what we have done. And so that leads to a second thing Paul goes on to remind Timothy is his task at Ephesus. First of all, he needs to speak up for the truth. Secondly, he needs to preach the gospel. When you talk about the truth, what is the, the emphasis? What's the main thing? Preach the gospel. Far too often we get caught up with rabbit trails. You want to go talk to a friend or a relative or a neighbor, and you want to go talk to him about the Lord and say, well, where did Cain get his wife? And suddenly you've taken your focus off the gospel and the need of salvation to some rabbit trail that will take you far from the point. One of the best things you can do is say to a person, well, we'll get to that, but let's stay right now on the main point we're talking about. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about salvation. Stay on track. Keep your focus on the gospel. The word gospel literally means good news. And the good news is that we can find salvation be saved from the penalty of our sins through faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us. The Old Testament law made no one righteous. Rather, it condemned everyone. But it does get us to see our sinfulness so we can need, see our need of a Savior. In fact, one of the best ways to keep people on track and to share the gospel with them is to use the Old Testament laws. You know, it's fine to say, well, God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. But you can also ask people, did you ever tell a lie? Well, you're a liar. Did you ever hate anyone? Well, you're a murderer. Did you ever have a lustful thought? Well, you're an adulterer. So if you're a lying, murdering adulterer, you need salvation. The Old Testament law shows us our sin, 
shows us we need salvation. So many people think, well, they're, they're good enough because, well, I try to follow the Ten Commandments. But if you try, the truth is you're not following them. You fail. And because we cannot keep them, we see we are all sinners and we all need Christ's salvation. So as Paul focuses Timothy on preaching the gospel, Paul then thinks about himself and he shares the power of the gospel by sharing his personal testimony of what the gospel did for him. Look down at verse 13. Paul continues on and says, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Paul was a blasphemer. He was violent. He was unbelieving. He was as bad as they get, the chief of sinners. But he was changed by the power of the gospel. Our first thought is to try to justify Paul. Well, he wasn't really that bad. I'm sure there were worse people out there. But that's just a rabbit trail that takes us off the main point. We preach the gospel because it is the gospel alone that has the power to convert even the worst of sinners. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. So, lest we ever forget, the power of the gospel can change even the worst person you know. You say, oh, you don't know my brother-in-law or my neighbor or my boss. Doesn't matter how bad they are, no one is too far gone. There's no one who cannot be saved by the power of Christ. And when we choose to place our faith in Christ and receive his salvation... 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. When we follow Christ, our whole life changes. So our charge is to preach the gospel. It wasn't just a charge for Timothy, it's a charge for each one of us. In fact, the last thing Jesus leaves with his disciples, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, we call it the Great Commission. A commission for every Christian. Therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So this is a charge for each one of us, so we need to ask ourselves, who can I share the good news with? Each one of us should be thinking, who is it that we can share the gospel with, this good news that God loves us, has provided salvation from our sins. Think, well, we could just start this door-to-door -door program and just go knock on every door around. Well, that would be fine, but the truth is we would be so much more effective if each one of us would just think about cultivating one relationship and how we could reach out to that one person and share our personal testimony of what God has done for us. Really, that is the most powerful witness, one which no one can refuse, refute, simply to say, hey, let me tell you what God has done in my life, and go on to share how God has changed you. So when you look at your life, what opportunities has God given you to share the gospel? So we have to look at the question, how do we live a godly life in a secular culture? And the first thing we need to understand is that we need to be willing to engage the culture, to stand, stand for what is right, to speak up for truth, confront false teaching, and to preach the gospel, to share the gospel with others. We don't have to be afraid about getting into discussions about any of a number of hot topics. Rather, we can rely on what the Word of God says. So we speak up for truth, we preach the gospel. 
there are three different biblical approaches that we could consider. First of all is the example of Jonah. Jonah is sent to Nineveh to declare God's judgment. And the people repent and God chooses to have compassion on them. But Jonah sits up on a hillside looking over the city, waiting for judgment to fall. It is the example of condemnation. And sadly, there are some Christians who just want God to get all those sinners and bring his judgment. But that is wrong because that does not model the heart of God, who is not willing that any perish, but that all come to the knowledge of the truth. The second example is the example of Esther, who is a Jew in a Persian society. She knows the truth when all around her are blinded by lies, but she hides her identity. She has adopted the pattern of accommodation. And sadly, there are many Christians who follow that example who just want to fit in. They just want to blend in with the crowd. They don't want to create any problems. They don't want to stand out. They just want to blend in with everyone else. But the third example and the best example is the example of Daniel. Daniel has adopted a pattern of transformation. He's in a pagan society, but he is not impacted by it. He stands for his convictions when everyone else is doing the opposite thing, even when his life is on the line. He stands for what is true. He seeks the good of his culture and the good of the people of God at the same time. So in our society today, we want to be transformational Christians. We don't want to isolate ourselves and just say, well, we're going to love God and hopefully God's going to wipe them all out. We don't want to just accommodate and say, let's just fit in and all go along with everybody else. We want to stand for truth, but love those who do not follow the truth and share the gospel so that they also can turn to Christ. But then in closing, there's one more call to Timothy we see here in chapter 1, which is to keep the faith. Or put another way, don't make shipwreck of the faith. When we think about famous ships, many times the ships that come to mind are the ones that have wrecked. The Titanic, the Lusitania, the Arizona, the Edmund Fitzgerald, all are famous for sinking. Sadly, there are many Christians whose notoriety comes from their sin, from the scandals, from their shipwreck. Jim Baker, Jimmy Swaggart, Ted Haggard, just mentioning their name, you think of the scandals that occurred. Paul warns Timothy, down in verse 18, not to make a shipwreck of his life. He says, Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. So to keep from making a spiritual shipwreck of our lives, what do we do? Let me just quickly mention three things. Number one, follow the word. Paul mentions the term instruction here. Many times we make a shipwreck when we go off thinking up ideas that sure sound good, but they aren't biblical. To keep from shipwreck, we need to study the Word of God. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2.15, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. So number one, we handle the word of God accurately. Number two, fulfill your potential. Paul talks to Timothy about prophecies that were made about him. Leaders of the church saw great potential in Timothy and encouraged him in ministry. Over in chapter 4, Paul says, Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. So Timothy had a gift. Paul says, use your gift. Don't stop using it. One of the greatest attacks of Satan against us is apathy, complacency. He doesn't need to go out and to have us go out and commit some terrible sin. He just wants us to stay out of his way. 
And sadly, there are many Christians who have become complacent. God has gifted them greatly, but they don't use those gifts in serving God. It makes us ask the question, am I active in serving the Lord? And then thirdly, finish faithfully. Far too many Christians start out well, but they give up the race. They get tired. They no longer feel the excitement of ministry. They become preoccupied with other things. Timothy is reminded to hold on to two things, faith and a good conscience. Have a commitment to the word and have a commitment to doing what you know is right. So we need to defend against attacks on our faith, but we also need to stand up for doing what we know is the right thing to do. To finish well, we need constant communication with our God. And that's what we're going to see next week as we move on to chapter 2 and talk about prayer. So in closing today, look at your life and ask the question, God, how can I do a better job of following you faithfully? Let's speak up for truth. Let's preach the gospel. And let's keep the faith. Let's pray. Lord, your lessons to Timothy are lessons that we need to learn as well. To speak up for what is truth. Because we have a culture that wants to twist the truth in so many ways. And help us, Lord, not to just get into side arguments, but always zero in on that which is important, to preach the gospel. To use the law to show others that we are all sinners, we all need salvation. And then, Lord, help us to hold on to faith, not to make shipwreck of our lives, but to faithfully follow you day after day, year after year. As you have given these encouragements to Timothy, so we also take them as encouragements to us to hold on to hope and to seek to follow you faithfully every day. Thank you, Lord, for what we see here in your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join us as we close our service. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the light of your word. We thank you that it illuminates our path. 
Lord, be with us this week as we go out to share that light with the world as we share the truth in love and as we seek intentional relationships with those around us. And we ask, Lord, that you bring us back safely again next week. In your name we pray. Amen. And you are dismissed. Yeah.